once the kid. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, and so we'll, but we'll stop recording once the Q and A section starts up, so you can feel free to to ask your questions without thinking that they're going to be uh, recorded in any way. The PowerPoint that we're going to be using will be posted up on the SFT website, so that you can go to it later on. As will this video be posted up as well. So it looks like. Let's see, we have about 40. I honestly don't know how many people will be here today. We know that a number of people attended the president's address today and it's a Friday afternoon. Our goal is to try to wrap this up around 4.15, 4.20 so that people can um, enjoy the rest of their day. So before we begin, let me, uh, I wanna do two things. First of all, I wanna introduce the negotiating team so that these are all individuals that were a part of this process. And if you have questions and know them and feel like more comfortable asking them, that's, that's great. Tina Zapili is our lead negotiator and uh, Tara Luke, uh, Carrie Sowers, Adam Miyashuro, Emery Giorgio, and we are missing Ann Pomeroy, who is currently engaged in a cat emergency. Uh, she hopes to be joining us later on. Carrie may have to, oh, um, it looks like Anne's just come in. So Anne Pomeroy is here as well. So any of these individuals you can reach out to and ask for clarification or questions about the, the MOA. Uh, one more thing before we begin. I would really like to reinforce what Emory said at the faculty assembly meeting today. It's extremely important. We spent a lot of time negotiating the COVID protections agreement and any movement forward in terms of understanding what your uh, program standards are need to be done with that in mind. We need you to, as you, as you address those, to keep uh, an eye on those COVID standard uh, agreements. And again, we'll be glad to help you out with them, but it's very important that you, you look at those as you go through this process. Uh, secondly, uh, is the NTTP agreement includes within it, as Emery pointed out at the meeting, includes within it references to standards that the NTTPs uh, can be evaluated on. And again, as you go through then, if you're thinking about if you have an NTTP in your program, that needs to be kept in mind as well. All right, uh, I'm sorry, all of you are on forced mute at the moment, uh, but we will turn that off when we move to the question and answer period. As is usual with our, um, our setups here, we, we really do want you to have the opportunity to ask all the questions that you feel are necessary. All right, Tina, you wanna load up the presentation? All right, so I'm assuming everybody can see it. If not, um, wave and we'll, uh, Emery. Tina, can you just turn on the closed captioning and Google Slides here at the bottom so we can see them on the in the Google Slide Deck? When you're back in the view mode, click on closed caption at the bottom. Present, and then at the bottom, click on captions. There we go. Just click on the captions button, it should work. There you go. Thanks. So as I said, Tina will be moving me forward uh, in this presentation so that if I don't spend as much time on a particular slide as you like, or you feel like you need, just think that and keep that in mind and we'll come back to it in the Q&A section. So the presentation is broken up uh, roughly into three sections. One is what our approach was to the negotiating team moving forward on this agreement. The section, the next section is the actual MOAs. One of the things you may note is that rather than having a single document, what used to be called the coordinator's agreement in which all of these positions were included, we have now broken them out into separate agreements. And then finally, 
a small section on uh, the task force summary, that is the conclusions that were put forth by the task force and how we address them and which ones are in progress and so on. So as you can see throughout the process, we were, we were guided by a variety of principles. One of the first ones was that we had over our uh, series of conversations with people in various programs who come up to us or just in our own, own programs ourselves, we had uncovered a number of inequities that had existed in the previous agreements. And this is, you know, some of these were just the product of the school growing, programs changing, varying demands, and the like. And so we wanted very much in this round of negotiations, and including leading up to the task forces, to identify what those inequities were and to try to do our very best to rectify them. We were guided at every possible spot by the faculty leadership task force. You will see over and over again that we ground our negotiation strategy, our goals, what we were after in that leadership task force, which included a massive survey which had been constructed and analyzed by faculty in the first two year piece of that. We wanted very much to try to get a decent balance between the work and the compensation, again, informed by our knowledge of the previous inequities, as well as the leadership task force. And then finally, we were trying to find structural issues that could be altered, fixed, and improved that would then have an ongoing positive effect on everyone's life. Again, this slide will be available with the whole PowerPoint up in our SFT website. You can go to it. If you click on this page, it'll take you right to the local agreements, although I think you can find them pretty easily. So one of the other, again, there's going to see a number of things that are going to emerge. One of them was that we have the same preamble through each of the agreements because we are trying to have a consistency across them. It was obviously not going to be the case that um, work, the types of work and the compensation would be identical in each case, but we wanted it to be the case that the underlying principles we're going to be the same throughout all of them. So you're going to see the preamble is the same all the way. Tina, when she put together this uh, PowerPoint, has circled uh, areas that were new. For example, uh, this definition here has been tightened up. And that's one of the things you're going to see in the new agreements is that there, it's not a radical change in many cases, but it is a tightening up, a clarification, a building on the hard work that had been done by previous negotiating teams over the years. We have been receiving a, a number of questions about elections and who's involved and so on. Notice, please, in the definition of faculty that it is full tenure track and non tenure track full time faculty, part time faculty, and then 13 O's, 13 um, uh, O's in the year the faculty is under contract. This follows in, in large part the master agreement, which differentiates between full and part-time faculty and adjunct faculty. And so when you're, when, you're wrestling, when you're looking through that agreement, it's saying, well, here's how you run the elections. You have the following faculty. You can refer back to this and it specifies what exactly that does mean. Now, the old section on, on annual reports have been moved to section E. Our goal here, again, informed by the task force, the surveys and so on, was to streamline and standardize as much as possible the annual reports. We had seen uh, a, one of the major themes that had emerged from the surveys and other kinds of investigation that we had done was mission creep for these positions, that management uh, was turning more and more to, well, let's have this in the annual report. Let's have this in the annual report. And, the, and, and then they would also get changed. 
each year. It's like, oh, now this year we're going to do this and so on. Now, there were lots of reasons why management would, might be doing this in terms of new um, expectations they were facing or new problems they were trying to do, but it made serious problems as far as faculty were concerned in terms of trying to be able to effectively write an annual report. So our goal in here is that is to keep the reports from becoming these ever expanding kinds of documents that, that demand more and more. The evaluation process of the faculty has been uh, tightened up. Again, we found that the previous language in there had been unduly contentious and really didn't contribute to the security of the faculty that were involved in any meaningful way. And so we worked with management to try to, uh, to try to find a better way to handle that process. This language came from varying sections of the old MOA and is now in the beginning, it applies to everyone. We implemented the following items, again, based on the survey discussions with, with individuals throughout uh, to move to a three-year term. That was, uh, a point of a lot of debate. Some people thought we should move to a four-year term. Others were um, like the two-year term, but overwhelmingly, at least as far as we could tell, the survey data was telling us that they wanted to move to a three-year term because the idea was that first year, you, you sort of just getting your handle on it. The second year, you really sort of got it, but then you were already done. So this became the rationale that many people put forward for wanting the three-year term. However, we insisted as we moved through there that, the, that it retain the flexibility for faculty to interrupt that contract if necessary. If, for example, you suddenly received an endowment, which would allow you to pursue a research project, this was something that we wanted it to be the case that you could go, okay, I know I signed up for three years, but this opportunity isn't going to come along again. I want to be able to jump on this now. So there is nothing in there that compels you to complete the three-year term. What we have found, I will tell you truthfully, is that almost all of the individuals that we have spoken with are already the kinds of folks who are personally ethically committed to once they have signed on to something, to finishing it through. So we saw no need to put any kind of punitive or um, coercive mechanism in there to keep someone in the position. Rather, we wanted to go the opposite way, which was to say, no, look, if there's real reasons why you need to step out of this position, we have, um, we have mechanisms for you to do so. And this is one we've been getting a lot of questions on. So I want you to understand that. And it is also preserved the flexibility on the part of the deans to recommend someone for a position. Uh, and we have in there those situations in which if they have to be more assertive about that, they can. By the way, this is a theme that occurs throughout the entire agreement. It, it is essential that uh, people understand that when we go into these, it is a negotiation. It is a give and take process all the way through that we may be fighting for everything all the way along the way, but we know that we're not going to get it. And management is in the same position. And so just as, as you go through this process, please keep that in mind. The negotiation is not simply a matter of uh, slamming your hand on the table and saying, uh, this is what we demand and so on. So now we move into the interdisciplinary minors. We added something to, uh, it's, and again, we don't think it is unduly burdensome. It is simply that to become an interdisciplinary minor uh, um, a coordinator that you need to have taught at least twice in, in the minor. Uh, again, we didn't think it was very much. There is also uh, the introduction of term limits. This was something else that was occurring uh, in, the, in the surveys and in the findings we were uh, uncovering as we went through the process, which was that individuals were either having others sort of force them to take these positions for long periods of time when they didn't necessarily want to, 
or others were simply taking them and keeping them. So this allowed for some interruption of that. You can see here that the compensation has remained the same for two of the four tiers. It's uh, increased in one of the tiers, that is the groups, and it has gone down in one of them. Uh, we were very cognizant in each spot as we went along the way that if we were going to see a decrease in compensation, we wanted to see a decrease in workload. And that's a, a theme, by the way, that we're continuing to push, even though management has tried to get a little squirrely sometimes in their pushback on this. Now, the assessment plan, this one, again, was something that came up in the surveys a, a great deal. Some programs were quite comfortable with how the assessment worked, but many, many people wrote in to say assessment felt to them like a moving target. They didn't know what exactly they were expected to be doing. They didn't know how to utilize the resources. And again, this was one of the problems where in the old model, the coordinator position became the dumping ground for every set of duties that management wanted done and that fellow faculty felt, I, I'm not really sure what to do on this. We don't know exactly what the director of, of assessment will be doing in the future. And that's an important question that we have to, as a union, work together with. Because depending upon how assertive management wants to be about gathering up assessment data, we, we did not, again, want it to be the case where this was all being dumped on a particular individual. So we're going to be moving forward on keeping an eye on that as we go along. I'm sorry, again, as I say, if I'm moving too quickly on this, but we, we do have a number of things we want to go through. And we're doing a balance between uh, trying to cover as much of this as possible and so on. I may at certain points turn things over to either Tina or Emery to go into greater detail about it. So the dual degree programs, should we stay on this slide, Tina, or do you want to move? On to the next. Okay. So this is a new structure to account for the differences. This is again, I'll, I'll tell you up front, this is one that we fought for. We tried to keep compensation uh, where it had been. And in every battle we have, in every war, we have sometimes we win and sometimes we lose. This one was not one we won. So if you can see, there's this distinction between internal degree programs with at least 15 students in it and external degree programs. And they uh, involve then different amounts of compensation, but again, as well, different amounts of workload that's entailed by taking on those positions. All right, so in this, the compensation for these was differentiated because of the different type of work the jobs entail. I, Another theme that's going to emerge from this, this agreement is a three-year agreement. We've done a lot in terms of trying to do self-reflection, re-examine who we are, what our leadership roles are. But that does not mean at all that we're confident we got it right on every single one of these issues. So there's going to be a, a fair amount of monitoring moving forward in anticipation of the next time that we do the uh, negotiations. All right, so now we're moving to, um, did, did I just pass a slide, Tina? Just, okay, you're good, all right. So this is all the same as before in terms for the um, uh, positions here for general studies, first year seminars, here we go. Again, if you take a look in here, there's the term limits. It, you know, we couldn't come up with a better term for this, the impeachment process. It's not a particularly elegant term and in our context of today, not a particularly pleasant one. But the idea was that if it did become clear that there was a person in the role who, for one reason or another, was simply not up to the task, programs needed to be able to have a mechanism whereby they could say, look, we've, we've got to go a different direction here. We've got to, to rectify this. And the process is more streamlined and clear. This, the first year seminar convener, was the same as in the previous agreement. Although, uh, uh, just to pause for a moment, one of the things that the task force did from its very inception, from the first, mind you, that the task force was really three years. It wasn't just a one year one. It was a really three year uh, task force. 
was to try to articulate and identify what we were calling hidden duties and responsibilities. That is ones that had always been expected, but were never articulated in agreements. And so we, as you can see through here, we revised this to be more specific and we hoped to better align with the actual position so that all of the things that were actually happening were being articulated. So the W-2 and the quad conveners, this is the same as in the previous agreement, although again, with our attempt to try to be more specific and clear about what's going on in there, see that again in this, um, so that, and, and again, this is a theme that's gonna emerge in here. We want you to be very familiar with the duties and responsibilities that are listed in this, and that if management or others try to force you beyond that, to reach out to us. We do not want the return of mission creep, whereby the idea is simply that because you hold this position, you were going to be um, uh, expected to hold this. In here in the group G conveners, this has been moved to a model which is more akin to what RNPD and FRC do and PTR, the Post-Tenure Review Committee, in terms of having a single position. Although the, uh, in those cases, for example, in PTR and in FRC, the, the share of those are not compensated. But in this case, it would be. Um, this change does not in, uh, impact the Faculty Senate General Studies Committee nor does it infringe on the work and the, the role of the chair of that committee, though it does create um, a set of duties and responsibilities that go with the convener of this position. This now takes us to the chairs um, and associate chairs. We uh, had a lot of discussion about this again, but let me just say that it, even though there were many people that wanted to retain the Stockton term of coordinator, the general view was that for um, a number of reasons, moving to the more conventional nomenclature of chairs was going to be better overall. Uh, and in here, you'll see in here what this, this one right here, please look closely at it. We have historically, gone, uh, had back and forth conversations with management when they have identified where someone should be in a tier, that is which program should be in what tier. And those uh, factors can change. And so we need to be able to have those conversations and adjustments with management. Please keep an eye on that. This is also lose, uh, used as well. These two sections here are the same as in the old agreement, but this one here, the SCH, refers to student credit hours, the number of enrolled students multiplied by the number of credits earned in a course. Our view is that over time, people will start to be comfortable and get used to this new approach, but we do know that there's gonna be a lot of questions in the early phases as we, as we go through this. This uh, codifies, this establishes professional development for chairs. Again, one of the things we found in the work leading up to this was that People had almost no formal training for what it meant to be a chair of a position. They were kind of, you know, it was, the baton was passed to them and it was a, in many cases a best of luck, hope it works out for you uh, approach, which of course is not the best way to mentor people. The union has an explicit role listed in there, you can see. So these sections here uh, remain the same as the old agreement, providing for compensation for each of the two additional requirements uh, for uh, chairs at the undergraduate and the graduate levels. By the way, what you're seeing here is, is the entire agreement. We are, uh, Tina has pulled the entire agreement and placed it in these PowerPoints so that you can go through it in this way, but you can also read through them separately. The new term limits show up here again, uh, in which you'll see that there's a break. Same thing you'll see again, this is the process whereby an, an individual can be stepped down. We really want to draw your attention to something that had only existed for a few programs before, but we liked it so much from the old agreement, we brought it into here, which was the idea of a job sharing. That is that more than one individual could take on this position. Hence the idea of co-chairs in which uh, you can divide this up and 
and by the way, this is no longer restricted, it, believe in the old agreement, it was restricted to very large programs. And now we've said, no, if it turns out that your program would benefit from having any, you know, if you were in a relatively small program such as philosophy, where we wanted to set that up, this makes this possible now. So how to, to calculate the terms, there's a detailed process in here that explains how it works. We fully anticipate that people will be reaching out to us and saying, can you walk me through this? My program is, is I mean, we, we think it's the following, but we don't want to get it wrong. And, and we think that maybe we got put in the wrong tier. That's, again, that's absolutely fine. Please be, be feel free to reach out. Emery? I also want to point out that um, at e each fall, the provost's office must submit um, a copy of the tiers to SFT and SFT looks at them. And if we find what seems to be a discrepancy, we might reach out to uh, individual chairs or associate chairs, uh, as well as assistant deans. And uh, I wanna thank uh, faculty members who have previously found um, inaccuracies in the tiers. Uh, so if, you, if you're if you looking at the tiers that, that or you are helping calculate them, um, you can always reach out to the negotiating team if you identify a discrepancy or are concerned. Thank you. Thank you. And we've, uh, so for exactly, I'm not sure if you would still be doing it, but Joe Stramati was always very good uh, working with us in Upper K Wing and helping us read through it. And again, one of those things where it, we're more than happy to listen to why they might have one particular um, understanding of the data and we would have a different one and then we can work through it. So uh, the new formula for the compensation came from the task force on faculty leadership. It was designed to try to, uh, for many years, people had argued that there were more factors involved than simply uh, faculty head uh, count and that there were other issues that were involved. And we thought this was a, a appropriate point. By the way, this came both from faculty side and from management side. Both wanted to have greater complexity in terms of representing the factors that were involved in calculating these kinds of positions. There's obviously, uh, you can take this too far where you can start to have 10 or 12 different kinds of factors involved. We think we've made a good start on trying to capture what will be the, uh, the essential ones. And then we can go forward as we move along. You see here, the breakdown of the, the new undergraduate program tiers. And it's done according to that uh, criteria that we were laid out on the previous page. And you can see uh, tier one. This was again, taking my home program of philosophy. We would still have a course release each semester if we chose. But again, we preserve the right to have that as a course overload if you felt that that was appropriate. We continue to support the idea that as professionals, you yourself can choose what is best in your life as to whether or not it should be a course overload or the course release. And then this is exactly what, what Emery was saying was, please keep this in mind as you look through and see where your program is in the tier, how that tier is calculated, and then you can check it with us to make sure that your they were all on the same board. So uh, one of the things that I'm sorry, I just this is I'd like to thank the Stoley Company for supporting us in this. Uh, one of the things that we sound uh, found cropping up in the uh, surveys was a extraordinary frustration on the part of coordinators, right, which will now be called chairs, in that they would be the quote unquote first point of contact for students, but they honestly had very little that they could do aside from going to their colleague and saying, so why did, you know, what was your rationale behind all this? Ultimately, if there was going to be questions 
on whether or not a grade would be changed or altered or some sort of uh, uh, issue taken up. It was gonna have to take place at the management level. And so, as you can see, we've removed that from the duties of the chair. It, it struck us as a classic case of uh, responsibility without authority. So that you were uh, in, a, in a dreadful position of having awkward conversations with colleagues and with nothing that you could really do about it. Where possible, we have tried to remove that kind of duty from the responsibilities that are listed here. Now, scheduling. This one was a huge split in the, in the surveys and the information that we did. I, I don't know how else to put it. There were some faculty that thought this was one of the most essential things that faculty could do. There were others that felt that this was the most burdensome and problematic aspect of being that. And, and scheduling did not necessarily mean the same thing for everybody. For many people, scheduling meant having to be the headhunter, going out and finding people and putting them into these positions. For others, it was how do I balance all of these varying competing uh, uh, spots? So we retained scheduling because, uh, again, it was a division, but we also thought that, that where possible, we wanted to keep things that were at the core of faculty governance in faculty governance. And choosing when classes are run and who as much as possible. I will say this before we move on, please always keep in mind that, that management has the authority to assign faculty to any class and time slot that they so desire. Most management is not stupid enough to simply heavy handedly do that, but but the idea that um, we can push back on that really emerges out of making sure that we have good relationships with them to be able to do that. Let me move on down. Just one last thing, Tina. The um, marketing was something that a number of, of faculty said, look, I, I don't feel comfortable with this. Now, we did have faculty who responded and said, I, hey, I like this. I think it's a fun part of it. I, I like doing it and so on. And that's fine. Work with the um, university relations and marketing department. That's fantastic. What we didn't want is it to be an explicit part of the duties and responsibilities of the chair such that you could, they would come to you and say, we need you here on Saturday and Sunday from eight till five to do a marketing survey for your, your program. Again, assessment in here is shifted to include the new director of assessment. There is money out there for people to, for programs to carry out assessment. And, and so we wanted to include that in there. And we've made a link even to the local agreement on that. Uh, and we wanted it to be the case that, uh, that people when they're reading through this go, you know, I think I got some ideas, but I'm, you know, I'm swamped with this but that there would be support for individuals that would do that. Again, I cannot stress enough, we do not know what the new director of assessments job is going to look like. It is simply something that we're gonna to have to figure out as we go along. And here um, for, the, for the FRST chair, the duties, once again, we, we worked really hard to make sure that they were accurate and detailed and actually aligned with what that position did. But, but that's a theme that goes through all of them. Once again, we move on to the graduate chairs, similar. New formula came out of the task force on faculty leadership. One of the advantages with doing that task force the last year of it with managers involved was that they had buy-in throughout the process. So that when we got to the negotiating table, we could both turn to it and say, well, look, we need to go in this direction, take a look, because this is something we've both seen. In the, uh, in the survey and the research that we've done. So the, the old system is listed there and uh, you can compare it to what we've got here. This is again, fairly complex. We're not assuming that anyone's gonna get this right through. Please read through it carefully, reach out to us and we'll be glad to discuss it. Uh, the responsibilities, same thing as I've been saying all along, attempting to be more specific, more clearly identified, more fully identified so that there are no, if at all possible, hidden 
duties and responsibilities that individuals are feeling forced to pick up, which, you know, uh, then management starts to just assume is going to be the case. This section on associate chairs, this is new and was introduced after discovering some inequities within these positions. The last time we did our, our, our MOA, the 2018 one, uh, we had a number of individuals come up and express frustration to us about the extent and quantity and complexity of the positions in here. For example, the, the you know, position for accounting, for finance, for marketing, for management, and so on. This was one of those areas where by having substantive responses from the individuals in those positions, we were able to go into the negotiating session and say, look, here's a clearly laid out detailed description of what's going on. Now, we only used headcount in here for the associate chair position. But that seemed to be at least a good starting point for addressing what had been a grievous inequity in the previous agreement we saw. I'm sure the people holding these positions will say this still isn't enough. But quite frankly, that's going to be the case, honestly, throughout all of this, is that individuals will be going, yes, but, but I, there, I do, I'm worth more. We could not agree with you more. Uh, as always, if management wants to create new pots of money to compensate our hardworking faculty, we're more than happy to talk to them about that. So this lays out all the duties of the associate chairs that are involved. Now this takes us to our wrap up, which is we pulled together what were the salient task force recommendations. And as you can see in here, we, we believe we have checked off a number of the ones that emerged. And, and down there at the bottom, you're gonna see uh, the marker for in progress, right? Because one of the things that we, we kept hearing discussions about was, aren't there more efficient mechanisms available electronically and so on to be able to do these, uh, these tasks that won't keep me bound to the desk like this? So that's what you're gonna see there in the in progress section. So, the annual report, that's in progress. We have to see what that's gonna look like. We have to see when, when the new versions of this are, are submitted, does management push back and say, oh my God, we need X, Y, and Z. We don't, we don't have that. And uh, the, the last one in here, again, something that we're gonna have to see. We, there were many, many different um, issues that had been raised in this three-year examination leading up to this. And our goal with management was to try to find a way to create a more fair, equitable, just approach towards um, designing the faculty leadership positions, their duties, and compensating them. So that is the, the presentation. What we'd like to do now is uh, open it up for questions. Uh, as as again, one of the things I think it's very important for you to know, this agreement was not negotiated by Tina in a back room all by herself, sorting through all of these things. Polly Sai would have wound up with 32 credits of, of uh, compensation had that been the case. So it really is the product of a team here, as well as built on the extraordinary work of the uh, task force, and I mean that going all the way back three years. The original task force members who came together and did the research on, um, on Stockton and the nature of it and all the white papers that were produced, moving into the faculty management task force, which was co-chaired by Helen McGovern, and, and that became the framework by which we did this. So I say all that because I may very well, I may very well turn an answer over to one of my colleagues rather than being the, the one individual that responds to this. Um, okay, so let me, so actually, let's see, 